Dr. Dalala and intends to amplify our Pacific community's voices as well as provide resources for higher education at the University of Utah. This Zoom webinar will be moderated, recorded, and offered later on our YouTube channel, the Pacifica Archive. Special thanks to Dr. Kehalani Vaughn, our faculty advisor, Kalei Duitupo, and Kaimana Kahali for bringing this webinar into all of our living rooms. Welcome everyone to our final Pacifica webinar um, episode of 2020. Um, we have a, an amazing lineup today and we're excited that everyone is joining us again on a Friday evening. Um, thank you for bearing with us and um, being part of this groundbreaking series that we're bringing here from the University of Utah. So today, just our agenda, we will be having a one and a half hour format, which will begin with our presentation and followed by a Q&A. Um, so just to remind everyone, if you have questions for um, our presenter to please write them in the Q&A box, and then we'll take those questions at the end of our episode here today. Um, also, we would like to just remind you all or share with you all, if you're interested in going to graduate school here at the University of Utah, we'll be hosting a series of workshops as part of the Pacifica Scholars Institute. Um, so be sure to apply. Please find the link in the chat box and on our social media if you are following us. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, signature event and final speaker of 2020. Um, with a quick bio and then turn the time over to Dr. Tevita Oka'ili. Um, Dr. Oka'ili is from Kolofo'o Nukualofa Tongatapu. Tevita is the author of the book Marking Indigeneity, the Tongan Art of Socio-Spatial Relations. His book is an ethnography of Tava and Tauhiva, sustaining socio-spatial relations of transnational Tongans in Maui, Hawaii. Currently, Tevita is a professor of cultural anthropology and the Dean of Faculty of Culture, Language and Performing Arts at Brigham Young University, Hawaii. Tevita teaches courses in cultural anthropology and Pacific Island studies. He holds multiple degrees, one in social work that's from here at the University of Utah and a PhD in social cultural anthropology from the University of Washington. If we were all here in person, I would say give a round of applause for uh, Dr. Kaili. And I just want to welcome you, Dr. Kaili, and thank you so much for agreeing to grace us with your presence here this evening. Um, as a um, current Tongan scholar, and um, we're just really grateful because of the paths that you have um, opened up for the rest of us as we have something to build upon with all of the work that you have done. So we're so happy and grateful and anxious to hear whatever you have to share this evening. So I'll leave the time for you and then we'll bring it back um, with Dr. Keha Ladivan and um, with questions and discussion. Um, Aloha Pito, um, Mwana, and uh, thank you, Dr. Kehaulani, Vaughn, and um, Mana, and Kale for the invitation. I'm deeply honored to be here and to present today. Um, let me see here. Let me get my, uh, uh, let's see if I, are you able to see my screen here? That work? Okay, so the title of my uh, talk today is Transindigenous Tava from Mauna Awakea, from uh, Mwana Nui Akea to Mauna Kea. And I am sort of uh, trying to uh, been, talk about this particular areas of Transindigenous that others have been talking about, uh, Dr. Vaughn and others, Vince Diaz have been talking about for a while. Oko tomu atapu mo e tangata i fonua vaihi mo e fonua wakea mo papa pe tapu mo e tangata i fonua o e tere ano masima ha ayuts soshoni koshut paiuts mo navaho 
I begin by acknowledging the sacredness of this indigenous uh, people of Hawaii and this land of Wakea and Papa. I also acknowledge the sacredness of the indigenous people of Utah, uh, Utes, uh, Soshone, Co uh, Koshutes, Paiutes, and of course, uh, the Navajo who came later. Uh, so that I may have permission to fulfill my responsibility as a speaker today. I want to start by uh, uh, talking about my intellectual genealogy that began at the University of Utah. I enrolled in the first Pacific Island Studies course at the University of Utah in 1997. That's about what, 23 years ago. Uh, this was the Ethnic Studies 391 Section 1 Pacific Islanders American Experience taught by Edwin Napia, a Maori scholar, and was co-taught also with uh, Dr. Fui Fui Lupe Nimetolu. So, um, this is the first specific study uh, course that I uh, took was here at the uh, University of Utah. From there, I took the Pacific Studies course and I took it to the University of Washington where I uh, attend for my uh, doctoral program in anthropology. I taught anthropology 307, which was cross listed Asian American Studies 300, which is uses, it was US Pacific Islander contemporary uh, culture. And I co-taught that with Professor Barbara McGrath and also Professor uh, David Palaita or Kavika, and many of you know him as uh, Mika, uh, who is now the Associate Professor of Critical Pacific Islands and Oceania Studies at the City College of San Francisco. Um, so just from the roots of University of Utah, and I know that now you have a uh, Pacific Islands initiative. Uh, you know, this was probably one of the first course that I took. Um, and, you know, I am a product of that. From there, I took that course here to, to uh, Brigham Young University here in Hawaii. And uh, I still continue to teach this course, uh, Anthropology 210, just Contemporary Pacific Society. So I want you to know that, uh, you know, this is where my roots began. And, but, and I also think that the you know, work that you're doing, you're continuing. And you'll know that uh, in the future, there will be many people who will continue to, to, uh, to benefit from the work that you're doing. Um, there. I want to begin by uh, uh, talk about the work that, uh, you know, my mentor, um, basically to talk about the way that he has helped me in my, in my work as a scholar. Uh, the architect of the Taba philosophy of reality, which is an indigenous uh, theory, is that started by Hu Fang Ayako Magoto Professor Kustino Mahina who's a Tongan historical anthropologist, uh, you know, received his bachelor's and master's in anthropology and then his uh, PhD in Pacific history from Australia National University. He's from Tefisi Vavau Tonga, student of the late Professor Futahelu, very close friend of the late Professor Epeli Hawofa. And he, is, he has the chiefly title of Hufang Hayako Mailoto. And I wanna acknowledge him because of many of my, my work today is deeply grounded in, in his uh, philosophy of uh, Dava. Um, I first met him again at the University of Utah. This was the Tonga History Association Conference uh, at the University of Utah in 2001. Um, as you can see here this uh, in this uh, picture, I'm pretty sure that you probably, many of you probably uh, remember this area at the, at, at the U. Um, you can see here that uh, Kustino Mahina is there, Futahelu, and the leather important Tongan scholar. Uh, you know, Devita Fale, many of you may know his, his work, uh, Filia Wipi is, is there, and uh, my, grand, my grandfather, my aunt, uh, many other, uh, Taniela Fiafia, who's also there. So, you know, this was, a, you know, an important area that, uh, we, you know, at University of Utah as, you know, going back all the way, you know, more than 20 years of sort of kind of creating this Pacific Studies. So, uh, Hufanga, uh, Dr. Uh, Augustino Mahina, you know, his work has been deeply grounded in the uh, Moana Nui deep history and arts. And he started, so the idea of Da as a marking, demarcation of time, and Va as space between the Da or the time interval or relationality or space between people that I have written, but all have based on, on his work. And we've been sort of talking to people about this. Just for some of you who may not have a background in Da, 
uh, oftentimes it's easy to to get the va part because relationship and in, in between space or the interspace is, is easy to understand. But da as a notion of time, sometimes it's difficult to understand. And the best way that I try to explain this is to think of somebody who's beating a lolly or a drum, uh, you know, lolly both in Fiji and in Tonga. Um, this is sort of a way of marking time. So da here is, is, a, is, is, a, is a form of marking time through beats or social action uh, to form, to perform. So just to sort of kind of help you to think about this idea of da. And the basic philosophy is ta is composed by va, and va is marked by ta. So, you know, these two are always uh, inseparable. Um, da is fu or form va is uho. So the, the, the basic idea of the Dava philosophy is the time and space of the fundamental dimension of reality. That reality is basically made up of time and space. So from, from an ontological perspective, like the philosophy of, of the nature of reality, Da and Ma is sort of the common medium of reality. But epistemologically, or just how we come to know time and space, uh, different cultures arrange it in different ways, yeah? Um, we may arrange time according to seasons or clock time as in Western culture. A rising and setting of the sun, um, yam season as uh, how they've done in Tonga, uh, social rhythms. Um, another way to think about um, this arrangement of Tava is through linear, circular, uh, cyclical, or reciprocal. And my work on Tawhiba is to, to see how that this, even your action and the way that you mark that space is done through reciprocity or even collaborative work. Um, the, the way that we venerate or honor our elders and, uh, or seniors and, and even the past as Kamele Hiva and Awofa and Mahina and other have talked about this sort of honoring the fact, past is a particular epistemological arrangement of, of, of Tava, of time and space. So just to sort of kind of give you an example of that. Another way to think about this is that all things come in Hoa Hoa is sort of the Tongan word for pairs, but uh, also come up in other uh, Moana Nui languages as friends or partner. Uh, so things comes in pairs, uh, whether it's similar or opposite. So tava, form, content, light and dark, red and black, an important culture, male, female, Maui and Hina, Wakea and Papa. Um, we may want to sort of kind of talk about whether this is binary thinking or dichotomous, but it's sort of important to think about how we do think about it in those ways. And then all things intersect. So there's an intersectionality element to the Taba philosophy that all things intersect. And the way that you think about this is, um, uh, is that we are being able to, to, to see that this connects and, 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 and so forth, okay? Um, let's see, are you all able to see my slides here? Is everything good? Sorry. Juana? We'll yeah. just pull the, uh, to redo the slide, to refresh it, please. Let's see, should I stop sharing? All right. Okay. How's that, Moana? Does that work? No? I, have, I don't see it yet. Okay. Let's see, let's reshare it again and see if it works. How's that? Yeah, can you make it full screen? Okay, let's make it full screen. Okay. Is that, is that it? Yes, perfect. Okay, Thank perfect. You. Okay. So continue on on the Tava philosophy of reality. And, and so there's an intersectionality, all things intersect, meaning con connect and separate, uh, leading to harmony or conflict. So there's an element of mediation, the symmetrical mediation to give rise to harmony and beauty. And of course, the Tava is about, you know, finding symmetry, uh, which is proportionality, balance, harmony, beauty, and equity. Or if it goes into asymmetry, it is uh, disproportionality, disharmony, inequity. Or another way to think about it is this is imposition, oppression where there is asymmetrical power relations. So if you think of colonialism or settler, settler colonialism or racism or sexism, these are all elements that are uh, part of an asymmetrical uh, arrangement of, 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 uh, of Tava or power relations. 
So the way that I've been thinking about this lately is to think about deep history and an ancestral geography as a place that uh, is often placed in front as a guide for the present and the future. And that all things in nature, mind and society intersect. So, you know, you know that many of my uh, work have been on Tao Hiva, which is uh, focusing on sustaining, you know, symmetrical harmonious relations with relative. This is relationality with people, uh, which includes both relatives and indigenous people. But I have uh, recently been developing the idea of Tauhi Fonua, which is the sustaining of, uh, of relationship, uh, symmetrical and harmonious with Fonua land and its people. So this is uh, sort of kind of the new area, but almost also I'm, I'm, I'm also critiquing my, my work, earlier work, which have focused mainly on just relationship uh, with relatives, but not uh, focusing on other people such as indigenous people of a place. Uh, for Tongans who may be living in the diaspora and so forth. And I tried to touch a little bit of that on my early work, but have not been able to sort of talk about it. So in, in this presentation, I'll be talking more about those particular area. So how do I uh, define indigeneity from like a Dabai's perspective? I see indigeneity as deep genealogical connection to ancestral times and, and places. Or another way to think about it is deep relationality with ancestral Da and Va. Uh, when I first presented this in, in 2018, uh, Kehaulani Kawanui uh, talked about it as deep indigeneity. She referred to my work as sort of kind of focusing on deep indigeneity. And so I like to use that. And I'm also challenging sort of the na you know, settler nation states idea of, of time and space, which is often truncated and you're not able to, to sort of see the full uh, deeper uh, idea of time and space. And th this picture here shows some of the uh, protests uh, of, of many of us, Hawaiian Tong and Samoan together. I will talk a little bit about it uh, in, in the work that I have done. Now to think about some of this is to uh, also go back and see some, how some people have been thinking about indigeneity. Um, uh, Daniel Honentes or Tekun has sort of kind of create a category for this. He, he has uh, like three categories. One is elder indigenous. These are the people who are ancestrally linked to a place and have linked continually to that place for century and millennium. This would be native Hawaiians in Hawaii or Utes in Utah. This will be the elder indigenous group. Then you would have regional indigenous people, people who are ancestrally linked to, the, to a region. They are indigenous to a region. They may have common ancestor with the elder indigenous people of that region. So for example, Tongan, Samoans, Tahitian, Maoris, and other Oceanians who are from Moana Nui Akea, meaning Oceania, but who now live in Hawaii or may live in Aotearoa or other places. So they're more indigenous to the region, to the Moana Nui area. Um, so this is the other category. And then the sort of the third category uh, according to Hernandez, and if, as many of you know, he's also a product of University of Utah, um, of, 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 your, of your program there. He talks about global indigenous people or people who identify with indigenous cosmologies or worldview, and they are indigenous from other places of the world. Um, you know, for example, Pacific Islander, Pacificans, Oceanians, Moanans in Utah, who, uh, who continue to have sort of that indigenous view and cosmology, but now they live outside of their region. So that would be the global indigenous people. Now, Mauna Kea had also their category of indigeneities and allies. And I really like this because Pua Case, as many of you know, who is a, an important activist at Mauna Kea, has basically three categories of indigeneity plus an uh, ally categories. So the first one is Nahua Aina. Nahua Ainas are those who are natives to Hawaii. Uh, and, 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 and you know, if you think about it in Utah, that would be the Utes or uh, Koshut or Soshonis. And then Nahua Velolike, these are the natives from the Pacific Islands or Moana Nui. This would be Tongan, Samoans who are now living in Hawaii. Nahua Pili would be natives of the continents who uh, Native Americans or so forth. Uh, who have come, who live in Turtle Island, but maybe have come to, to Hawaii. And then Naho Aloha with allies who think alike, these are people who may not be indigenous, but continues to have sort of that um, uh, framing or view of the world. So this is uh, the way, in, and, and if you have been to Mauna Kea, this is the way that uh, was categorized. And, and, and of course, Pua Case was the person who did this. 
Now, remember, notice the idea of Hoa that I talked about, this concept of how things comes in pairs. And you notice that even the Hawaiian concept of indigeneity and this, the categories uh, based on Pua's work, you can see that it also has this idea of Hoa, whereas Hoa Aina or Hoa Velolike, you know, indigenous to the place, but also people who may be indigenous from other places. But even things such as indigenous people and settler, this is, you know, this is a Hoa, of course, uh, to maybe think about, and we'll come back to these in our Talanoa. Now, the, the idea of sort of kind of juxtaposition of indigenous history and geography to identify intersection, it's been being done by many people who have done this work. Um, Professor Vaughn has been writing about this uh, in her dissertation on trans-indigenous collaboration, and even her more recent uh, article on trans-indigenous recognition, where people who are may not be indigenous to a place, but come there and continue to recognize you know, something that nation state do to one another. Or Vince Diaz's work of trans-indigenous resurgence, and he's talking about, uh, you know, Micronesians who are living in Minnesota and the work that they're doing with uh, Native Americans there in uh, sort of, you know, creating uh, canoe and va'a cultures there and, and bringing that, reviving that by just sort of uh, the, the work that the two groups are doing. Um, one important area of trans indigeneity that I would like to sort of kind of bring to our attention to maybe think about is that to maintain the grounding in the particularities, but then reach across indigenous community through connections and collaboration. So one of the things is that we don't want to lose the particularities, the specificity of different indigenous group that they continue to maintain that yes, still find some sort of, of com commonality, commonalities uh, across. And others have been writing about this uh, on, on this particular issue. Now, the work that I started, I started working with um, Ten Khan uh, and Fonoti, uh, uh, Kavika Ten Khan, who's a Hawaiian anthropologist, and uh, Rochelle Fonoti, a Samoan anthropologist. We, we started writing about genealogy and genealogical ties to place and what it does as far as giving responsibility to care for that particular place. So with genealogy, of course, come uh, great responsibility uh, as Hawaiians think about this in Kuliana, uh, as others have written about it, uh, Professor uh, Mon and others, and Fatongia um, also. And, and, and even um, Professor Hokulani Aikau has talked about this sort of Kuliana for you know, people who live in Utah and what are their responsibility to a place like such a Yosepa as a land of the Koshus. Um, and the important uh, sort of uh, questions have been asked, of course, by uh, Haunani K. Tras uh, about people who are you know, not from that place, not native, are they settlers? Yeah. Um, do you think of them as settlers? Or is there something more to this? Or are they native interlopers? I like this sort of term that was used by um, Professor Vaughn. You know, natives who live outside of their homeland but who do not actively recognize the land or its genealogical caretakers. So they're just sort of there, but they're not doing the fulfilling the responsibility. So now what I want to do is sort of kind of, I, I know I was just going to give you the sort of theoretical aspect of the Tama uh, theory and its connection to trans indigeneity. Now I want to give you some example of some of this work uh, to sort of ground. What, and I know many of this example are coming from Hawaii, but I, as I'm giving you these examples, I hope you'll be thinking about, you know, what your sort of responsibility in Utah as, you know, as Pacific Islander, as uh, people of Moana Nui who live there. It all started for me with Nepali in 2000. Uh, Nepali is the National Pacific American Leadership Institute. Uh, some of you have uh, participated in this, uh, Moana and um, of course, Professor Vaughn, uh, other have been part of this. This is a, a uh, a leadership Institute created mainly by Native Hawaiians, but have invited others, Samoan Tongans, and many other groups to participate in. And it's a very trans-Indigenous because there are people from all the different cultures who come and talk and, and think about what it means to, to, to live either in your homeland or outside of your homeland. From there, I participated in the Hokulea voyage in 2003 from um, Honolulu to Molokai. And so sort of these are sort of kind of the beginning of my work in trans indigeneity. From there, um, I started working with my students in uh, preservations of um, 
heiau. Heiaus are traditional Hawaiian um, ancient temple and sort of um, preservation, conservation. This is one close to my university that I've taken my student. That's been going on since 2012, where I take my students. But we also have uh, important ties to this place. There's a sort of a trans-indigenous tava in my work at Mauna Wila Heiau because it's also connected to Hamonga a Maui in Tonga, which is a trilothon in Tonga. And, and the, the connection, there are many different connections. One of the connections is just the way that is set up to align to sort of measure the movement of the sun. Both the Hamonga a Maui in Tonga and Mauna Wila sort of uh, measure or uh, mark the movement of the sun in the same sort of uh, direction. And this is uh, very, very important to see that there is connection. But other connection, even from Mo'olelo, where the caretaker of this heiau is from Vavau and Upolu. And we know Vavau and Upolu are places in Tahiti, Samoa, Tonga, Aotearoa, and other islands. So the caretaker of this heiau that's here in Haula, that's really close to us, uh, is connected not only to the whole Native Hawaiians, but also connected to other places within Moana Nui. Uh, Kea, especially in this uh, particular. In um, 2014, we decided to do a sort of ava ceremony or kava ceremony to, to bless this particular heiau and kind of say, you know, we want to bring this back and have it as a place for people to go and learn. And in this ava ceremony, it's a very trans-Indigenous ava ceremony that mix both Tongan, Samoan, and Hawaiian in an ava ceremony to uh, bless a Native Hawaiian um, uh, heiau. And, uh, and as you can see, the people who are involved in this Ava ceremony are from all of these uh, specific different communities. Other things that I've been involved in uh, have been Lakuokua. Uh, Lakuokua is the Hawaiian Independence Day. And this has been going on. Uh, my involvement goes back to 2014 as sort of kind of uh, uh, Hawaiians have been trying to bring this uh, holiday to, I know, so that people know more about this holiday. And I've been involved, and then many of my students have also been involved in this uh, particular um, holiday. The Mauna Kea rallies that have been involved, it goes back all the way to 2015. And even back in 2015, it was very trans-Indigenous because many of the uh, Maoris, uh, as you can see here in this, in this photos of the ones who were holding the Tinoranga Tiratanga flags of Aotearoa, um, but other groups have been coming together to sort of work in, in this particular space um, uh, of, uh, you know, standing up for Mauna Kea. In 2018, uh, I was involved in remapping trans-indigeneity of Kanaka and Tangata in Hawaiian, and we had this panel. Uh, and you can see that uh, Kumuhina, who is well known here, is uh, Hawaiian, of course, but has very much strong ties to Tonga, join us, and Ulise, uh, you see uh, Ulise Funaki there, who is Hawaiian Tongan, and Kat Lopendog. And we sort of begin to, to think about, you know, what are the relationship here and uh, the responsibility of Fatongia of Tongans to, to Hawaii. This, of course, this was 2018, which led us to our uh, visit to Mauna Kea in 2019, July 2019. Uh, many of us went and stand in solidarity with uh, Native Hawaiians up at uh, Mauna Kea. Uh, we also started to attend other events such as La Hoi Hoiea, which is the Hawaiian Sovereignty Restoration Day. Uh, you can see Tongans, Fijians, and others who, um, before it was mainly a Hawaiian um, uh, holiday or Hawaiian commemoration, but many of us since Mauna Kea have started to um, attend and participate in many of this. We held a rally here of Oceania for Mauna Kea rally here in Laie in 2019. Um, you know, many of the people here in Laie, of course, are uh, Latter-day Saints. Many are work at the Polynesian Cultural Center. And so, you know, maybe one of the questions that we can talk about in the Talanoa is, you know, just how this, this trans-indigeneity as far as as um, you know, uh, working to to help indigenous people, and and where do you sort of kind of see where that happens versus maybe the commodification of culture and commercialization of culture that happens at, at the Polynesian Culture Center? So there's some sort of kind of um, you know disconnect in in some area, and and there's some complexity here that we may want to come back and talk about this later in our Talanoa. In our visit to the Mauna Kea, what we did is. Uh, Ulise uh, Funaki, he actually connected our genealogy as Tongans to Hawaiians 
through the genealogy of uh, the Kumulipo and to see the Tongan lines in the Kumulipo that matches with the uh, Hawaiian, uh, you know, uh, the Tongan and the Hawaiian, such as Kanaloa or Maui Akalana, which is Maui Atalanga, Maui Kiki, and Maui Kisikisi, and others. So, um, you know, this was one of the ways just to sort of kind of say, hey, we have genealogical ties and we also have responsibility to this place of, of Hawaii. And this was take, basically taken from the Tongan cosmogony, uh, which is, um, you know, has many different lines that uh, we don't have time to go through it, but, you know, perhaps maybe in our Talanoa, we'll come back and, and talk about some of these specific areas, um, especially the Tongaloa, Maui and Hina lines, which are very much connected to the, to the Hawaiian lines. And in our offerings at Mauna Kea, you know, um, Ulisse spoke Hawaiian and Tongan and English to sort of present our, our, uh, our gifts to the kupuna up at, at Mauna Kea. And the, and the gifts that we took were, were very uh, strategically uh, selected because uh, kava and to or ava and ko or uh, kava and sugar canes are two important um, plant for us in Tonga that originated from a place called Eweki or Hawaiki. And according to Tongan tradition, this is where Hawaiians uh, would reside when they visit Tonga. So we were sort of bringing this connection. And, and we also know that this are also very much connected with Kana and Kanaloa. So the, the, the offerings were, were brought in ways to, to show that, hey, we, we have this uh, you know, trans-indigenous spirituality and connection, including even the tapa or kapa or ngatu, which is connected to Hina, you know, goddess of tapa making, both for Tonga and, and Hawaii, in the sense that, the, you know, here is another, another uh, trans indigenous connections between the, the two groups. Um, so, you know, the offerings that were taken were selected specifically for sort of like, you know, rekindling the, the va of Hawaiians and Tongan or in sort of a tauhi va, reestablishing this. And this is something that I didn't really talk much about it in my book because I think at that time there wasn't really a lot of uh, you know work together with Tongans and Hawaiian. But but since Mauna Kea and I even say a little bit before that, you begin to see this as much uh, you know interactions that's been going on between the two group. There were some other elements to sort of think about. You know the connection between Wakea in in in. Hawaii, yeah, because Mauna Wakea, and Langiatea in, in Nomuka, in Hapai, in Tonga. Uh, you know, scholars such as, uh, you know, uh, Rubelite Kavena Johnson's maintained that the Langiatea in Tonga is a human edifice built as a memorial for Wakea. And, and this is probably the one uh, memorial outside of Hawaii that is found in Tonga, in uh, the island of Nomuka and Hapai. Maybe some of you who are listening in are from this area to see that you know some of these connections were brought up by us as we were re-establishing this trans-indigenous tava. The other aspect that we did was that we you know we brought some of the even the older uh, letter from King Kalakaua of Hawaii to King Tupo the first of Tonga uh, who wrote a letter back in December of 1886 to create a coalition um, of Tonga and he established the Royal Order of the Star of Oceania and um, you know, one of the quote from the from this uh, la, uh, you know letter that he wrote is that Tongan people are a race closely allied to blood uh, by blood to um, Hawaiians. Um, you know, King Kalakaua also created the Royal Order of the Star of Oceania, Kahoku or Oceania, and you can see here that Kalakaua preceded Hawofa, uh, you know, by many, many years. You know, he, was, he started to think about Oceania or Oceania in Hawaiian and also created a royal order for people who uh, were creating this, this particular way of, of thinking. And, you know, uh, Professor Vaughn's work on, you know, uh, trans-indigenous recognitions, this is sort of, we were reviving some of these trans-indigenous recognition that happened in the past and, and so brought back to us during the Mauna Kea. Um, time. Um, even even the, the, the Taovala that many of us wore when we went to, um, to Mauna Kea, uh, many of us were selecting, you know, a particular Taovala that were uh, important to our families. The one that I'm wearing here, or one that uh, belonged to my grandfathers, 
Um, others were wearing uh, taovala or waist mat that belonged to their grandma. So many of the special heirloom taovala were worn by Tongans as they went up to Mauna Kea because they saw this as a very special and an important um, e event. One of the probably the, the most in interesting and fascinating uh, thing that happened during this was that um, in our visit to Mauna Kea, we started to look at some of the connection between Tonga and, and Hawaii. And you know, one of the groups that led our delegation to Mauna Kea, this is the Tonga sister. Many of you are familiar with them. This is Telesia, Afiaki Tonga, and Walter Tonga's uh, uh, children, and also Kat Loben, uh, who's a, a student, a graduate student in anthropology at UH Manoa. Uh, they, they actually led our delegation to Mauna Kea. And then later we found out that um, they are actually the descendant of Alexander Blake, who was the first Hawaiian kingdom consul to Tonga in 1855. And the Hawaiian kingdom cons consulate in Mawa'o Tonga. And, um, and these were actually their descendants who were leading our delegation up to Mauna Kea, which was kind of very amazing that sort of the ancestors were were um, working with them in sort of kind of rekindling this, this idea that there was this uh, uh, connections that were happening. Um, I also attended together with the Fijians from Mauna Kea. And what was interesting, even with the Fijians, the Fijians were also like bringing up some of the Hawaiian diplomatic and consular representative that live in, Le in Levuka in Fiji, going back all the way to 1857 and 1859. So, you know, some of some of these was like, you know, sort of reviving just the, the trans indigenous Tava or even the recognitions that they, that was there. But it took Mauna Kea to sort of kind of bring everyone, and even for people to sort of research to find out that these were some of the things that were that were happening. Um, and part of the reason why I went with the Fijian because, you know, I, uh, my 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 maternal side uh, is from uh, Malau in Fiji and also Taveuni in other places. And that was part of the, the reason I joined the Fijian. And, and I also know that the, you know, the Samoans also went up there. Uh, if, if Jake uh, Fitzamanu is probably here uh, listening in, um, you know, he might be able to tell us about some of the work that they were doing in uh, creating this trans-indigenous work. Of course, the uh, uh, Fijians brought Ava to Mauna Kea. And so, uh, you know, sort of bringing something that have already been connected by the, the two cultures. Now, one of the things that we learned from Mauna Kea was that uh, in Mauna Kea, Moana Nui Akea flags uh, were there of, you know, Tonga, Samoa, uh, Aotearoa. Um, and and we, we noticed that this was something that they learned from Standing Rock because it appeared that Standing Rock uh, or maybe even the I don't know more movement uh, that was going on sort of kind of started this idea of create of using flags as a way to mark that the different um, indigenous groups were there. And so Mauna Kea started this. Uh, Standing Rock started this and then Mauna Kea also did this. And, and so we were noticing this. Now, um, after I went there, I brought this back. I, I came and spoke at, at Mana Academy, as some of you are very familiar with Mana Academy there in West Valley. Um, you know, Mana Academy has sort of been doing a lot of, you know, trans indigenous work in thinking about this idea of how uh, different groups are connected to each other, especially um, people from Wana Nuiake, but also other people, indigenous to that, to the place of sort of West Valley and, and Utah. One of sort of the kind of the very interesting thing that happened with um, Mauna Kea is that if you are even familiar with this, you know, the, the song Kuha Aheo, you know, this is a Kumuhina song. What Kumuhina did is she took this, the lyric, uh, this just sort of the kind of the tune of the music from the Tongan choir that, uh, you know, she attends Tongan church here in Hawaii. And then she used that tune to create the, the song Kuha Aheo. And then, of course, the Mana Academy took this and and then and then used it. So it, it was kind of interesting, sort of trans indigenous, from Tonga to Hawaii and then back to Tonga. So from Tonga to Hawaii and back to Tonga, in, in, in the way that uh, the, this was sort of created. Uh, and and I, I think there's some of the possibility that could be created through trans indigenous Tava. I will also involved in sort of the Aloha Aina. Ku uh, Kahi, uh, Together We Rise Unity March. Many of us from Oceania, from Wananui Akea uh, came together. We created a specific t-shirt 
for Tongans to wear at this at this march. As you can see, here's the T-shirt, Malu uh, Mauna Kea, which is uh, you know uh, protect Mauna Kea and it has Kukia in Mauna. Uh, we are ocean, one face, one race. But the quotation at the bottom there is taken straight from King Kalakaua's talk. Yeah? The Tongan people are raised so closely allied by blood to the Hawaiians. And that was, um, you know, our sort of a kind of a way, and of course we created a Mauna design there with, with both Tongan and Hawaiian uh, geometric kubesi uh, in it to sort of kind of bring this focus together. Um, again, you can see here, these are, you know, Delesia Tonga and, and her uh, children who are also descendants of the first consul, first kingdom of Hawaii uh, consul to, to Tonga. <clears throat> So in this sort of kind of Oceania for Mauna Kea, you know, many of us came together and, you know, it, this was only a few months before we ended up having our own protest rally here in Kahuku. Now, if you're not too familiar with the Kahuku Kukia'i Mauna to Kukia'i Kahuku, um, people here at Kahuku have been sort of resistant to the wind turbines that's been built. Uh, that's been dis destructive to not only to the Aina, but also specifically to the Opeapea, which is a Hawaiian uh, hoary bat. Uh, and, and so many of us uh, sort of took what we learned from Mauna Kea and brought it to our own um, protests here. We saw this as, you know, because we saw that we were connected to Mwananui uh, ancestors, especially here in Kahuku, which is connected to Maui and Hina. And we saw this as our responsibility as Tonga and Samoans, who were also connected to Maui and Hina, to stand up and also protect this particular place. What was interesting is that the night before we decided we were, what we decided to do is we were gonna block the road just like what they did in Mauna Kea to block the bringing in of these. Um, we, we're, we're not anti-wind, uh, anti-energy, um, uh, green energy, but we are just anti because this is, you know, was sort of kind of a colonization. Uh, there was a, a Ahu Kupuna, an altar that was created for us, for the ancestors. And we were asked to come and sort of uh, participate in this Ahu. The speeches were given in Hawaiian, Samoan, Maori, and even Tongan. It was consecrated by Ava or Kava. And many of us were sort of kind of talking about our ancestors in this, in this altar that we created before we knew that we had to engage with the police officers and sort of a way of us to sort of uh, ground ourselves, but also ground ourselves in sort of deeper, uh, deeper history. Uh, we, we created a camp, which will also, as you can see, was really uh, very similar to the camp at, at uh, uh, Mauna, Mauna Kea. So Mauna Nuya Kea or Oceanian flags were there, as you can see our camp. Uh, this is our camp here with many of the different um, uh, flags. And we did all of this to sort of kind of ground ourselves and to remind ourselves who are all in part of this trans-Indigenous movement. And this all happened before we we began our standoff with the police officers here in, in Hawaii. It was a 37 day standoff with 202 arrests. So um, probably one of the highest arrests here. I, I think also the arrests during uh, the protests at Kaho'olawe was probably similar to the, to the number that we had here. Um, you know, and, and the people who were involved in this you know, were mainly people from Wananuiakea, including Native Americans that were Native Americans who also were participating in this. One of the sort of kind of very interesting thing here, and for you who are who are in Utah may, may be interesting to see here, you know, the Tongans who were interested, who participated in this, you know, they came out wearing Tawala in a way that you probably have never seen Tawala used before. You know, most people are wearing this to go to church or go to weddings and funerals. But to a protest, this was sort of kind of a new area to, to, to see how it was, it was used. And these are, um, you know, uh, getting arrested for protecting the land. So it was basically wearing the land to protect the land. Yeah? So Tawala is, is a symbol of the Fonua of respect to the Fanua was also used in sort of kind of this new way. Um, I have seen it used in pro-democracy uh, protests in Tonga, um, but not in a way that people have been arrested. So sort of, a sort of kind of a new way to think about the use of Tawala. So there was a sort of an arresting of Moana Nui Akea, of Hawaiian Tongan, Samoans, Maoris getting arrested together. 
um, in this sort of a way as in solidarity and you know bringing you know the, the groups uh, to, together. Um, you can also see this uh, here, you know, and even some of the symbols that were that were used. Yeah, the, many of the symbols here, whether Maori symbols and others that were that were used. Um, and here's when I started to think about moving from Tauhiva to Tauhifonua, which is also a form of Tauhiva, but this is more caring for the land, which includes both people and um, and land. Uh, this is the night I was arrested. Um, you know, I was, as you can see, I was, uh, I, I'm like in many different symbols here. I have a Hawaiian flag, a Tongan hat. Um, uh, the police officer who arrested me thought that I was Hawaiian. They were, many of them just didn't know if they were Hawaiians. So they thought everybody was Hawaiian, um, not knowing that there were also, you know, not just Hawaiian, but Tongan, Samoans and others who were, even when I was in jail, uh, the people who were my uh, jail mates, you know, were. Samoans and, and, and Hawaiians and, and others um, in, in the same place. Now, many of the things that we were doing here was basically to sort of kind of say, hey, you know, we're here to protect Opeapea, which is a kinolau of, of Kanaloa, Tangaloa. And as people who have genealogical ties to Tangaloa and Kanaloa, this was our kuliana, our fatongia to stand up and save this as part of our fight. You know, this has been a fight that's been going on for 10 years, our opposition. Uh, this is the you know uh, the most recent photos of our Kahuku High School, and you know you see the turbines, you know right 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 there. Um, it was a violation of epic free prior and informed consent of you know uh, people were just you know doing this without even asking. Even in the signs that were used in this, there were signs that were both in Hawaiian and Tonga. So you see Onipaakako, uh, Ofa Fanua, which is to you know, a Tongan version of Aloha Aina, you know, love of, of the land. The singing at the protests were both in Tongan and Hawaiians. Uh, they were singing in Samoans. So Samoans were also part of the groups who were, you know, so what we did at during our protests, you know, Hawaiians would sing and then the Tongans would sing and then Samoans would sing. And by the, you know, 37th day, we were already learning each other's songs and we were like, uh, you know, singing. Uh, the, 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 each other song by by the end of the blockade. We also created sort of a kind of a Kula Nuyo Kahuku University, a trans indigenous. You can see Dr. Lee Kava here came to do a, a workshop with us. Uh, Joshua Manguel also did. And perhaps maybe the last thing here that I sort of kind of uh, uh, maybe uh, towards the end and finish up here is that we even create a com composition of a new Kahuku Aloha Aina song that's written in Hawaiian and also in Tongan. And uh, myself and Nakia Naiole, who's Hawaiian, and Ulise, who's Hawaiian Tongan, sort of sat down and wrote this song. And it was all written in, some vers verses were written in Tongan, some were verses were written in Hawaiian, and then translated back to Hawaiian and translated back to Tongan, and then also English. And as you can see, here's the Aloha Aina song that we wrote. Basically, our song is, is a, a song about the pea, Kanaloa, the oppression of the colonial turbines, our love for the land of Maui and Hina and, and hoping for the return of that. And that was for us an, an important way of sort of kind of saying, hey, now we can, you know, in sort of trans-indigenous spirit, we're bringing um, all of us together. The last, uh, it's just going to, to think about, well, this is the, the last protest that I've involved is, is uh, Kahuku is, is now a place for 1.9 billion missile defense radar, which is opposed by all the groups here, including the Ko'olau Hawaiian Civic Club. And so I, I, I'm a member of the Ko'olau Hawaiian Civic Club and been uh, you know, working together with them on you know, opposing, opposing this. This is also gonna be a trans-indigenous opposition to uh, sort of the militarization of, of Hawaii. To just sort of end with uh, some of the things to maybe think about uh, critical trans indigeneity is to, you know, think about ways to always give priority to the elder indigenous groups, the Nahua Aina in, in poor cases idea, to maintain the specificity and, and also commonality where things intersect, both connect and separate. So for example, I'll just give a quick example, like Tangaloa and, and, and Kanaloa, 
they definitely connect in certain ways that they also uh, disconnect in others. So it's very interesting, a connection and separate, and to keep the two separate, but also come together in where they connect, where Tangaloa and Kanaloa connect. Um, and, and of course, you know, what are the responsibilities and maybe even the rights of indigenous groups in the diaspora? Um, you know, Aikau has sort of, you know, uh, Professor Hokulani Aikau has raised this with uh, Hawaiians at the Yosepa there in uh, Tuila. Um, but also Vaughn has also raised this in her dissertation and also her other work in thinking about this. And so I hope that maybe we'll have a Talanoa to think about trans indigeneity in a very critical way. And with that, Malo Alpito. Thank you, Dr. Kaili. Um, we're going to move into our next portion of this. I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Kealani Vaughn. Um, she is an assistant professor here in education, culture, and society and the Pacific Island Studies um, Initiative at the University of Utah. And she's our faculty advisor for Pacifica um, Scholars Institute. Um, her work that you uh, mentioned is about trans indigeneity, decolonizing pedagogies and practices and indigenous education. So um, before we break out, um, we want to just let all of the uh, attendees, if you have any questions, please drop them right now in the Q&A while we have a short discussion in transition. Um, this is your chance to, to um, if you have any questions for Dr. Kaili. Mahalo nui loa, um, Dr. Kaili. Always glad to you know hear your mana'o and your ike that you share with us. Um, I I really love your work, and the reasons why I love your work is because, um, you, as you can see, you know from this presentation, those that are joining us, um, Dr. Kaili's uh, research is very grounded in um, community engagement, right? And so I really, the first question that I want to pose to you, Tevita, is for you to kind of expand on that. Like how important is um, your relationship to your research being based on your community engaged work in the community? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think the first question for any researchers is to think about, you know, the community that they live in. You know, oftentimes researchers will go and research uh, some topic far away, they will fly many hours to another place and do research there and then sort of kind of neglect the own place where their university is at or where they live. Um, and, and for me, that's sort of kind of very elitist and privileged to be able to sort of kind of disconnect yourself from what's all happening within your environment. And so that's one of the reason why for me, all my research now are sort of like right in my neighborhood and where I live um, be, be, because uh, this is the most important aspect for me is to, to make sure that I'm like thinking about my community and what I need to do with my community before I could go and, and do research in, in, in other places. I'm not saying that it's wrong to do research in other places. I think that's fine. But, you know, engaging in your community is, is, is important to sort of bring that knowledge and, and use that with, within your, and, 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 you know, and the other part is that you have responsibility yeah? for all of us who are living in the diaspora you have responsibility to the indigenous people of that, of that, of that community. And that's a very indigenous way of thinking about it. Um, and, and so I, I would say it's, it's not always an easy thing to do. Uh, you know, sometimes the community may not accept you or, you know, maybe, you know, or, oh, here comes the anthropologist, right? Um, who wants to just study us. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the first to be critical of anthropology in that way, but you have to, you know, you gotta work hard to try to earn that. Um, that trust and say that you know I'm here for the community, not because I want to publish and you know get tenure, uh, but I'm you know I'm here for the community in, in that sense. So yeah. And then building off of that, um, you know, we were one of the seminars that I taught this semester was on indigenous methodology, and so you know what you were just sharing with us in terms of you know, going in, in and really trying to figure out what research will benefit the local community. I see that as definitely being part of an indigenous methodology that that responsibility of being able to give it back first and foremost, and yeah. not, necessar not necessarily coming with an agenda. 
Um, and I know that because you've been part of so many spaces that you've taken part of where you are, to me at least, an example of the values um, that we should embody, right? As part of um, people that are part of, you know, the academic institutions and the ways in which we can kind of critically engage um, and, and try our best to benefit the communities that we're a part of. So I know that you do that a lot. So I just wanted to thank you because I think you've opened up a lot of pathways for many of us, um, even those um, that are not Tongan. So mahalo nui. Um, and I think we have some other questions in the chat box. I think going along with uh, this conversation that both of you are having with ethics and um, the um, responsibility we have towards our own communities. One of our undergraduate scholars um, asked, going back to the points on the PCC, how can we reconcile the benefits of bringing together trans indigenous people and the problems of commodification and exoticism? Yeah, really very, cool. This is one yeah, of our very, undergraduate scholars, so. Wow, that's great, love that. Um, yeah, and that's part of the, the complexity of a community because uh, often community will engage in certain uh, and critique uh, certain things and then other state they would not critique, right? Um, and, and so that's one of the th things that's happening here in my community is that, you know, we are willing to stand up for Mount Kea, we're willing to stand up for the turbines, um, but, you know, we're still thinking about the Polynesian Culture Center because many people work there. And we're still thinking about our Kahuku mascot. Um, you know, this mascot that we have that is, you know, been uh, highly problematic because it's, a, you know, a, a Native American or maybe Polynesian. And so these, these two areas are sort of very sensitive to the community member. And for me as a scholar, I could I, I see how problematic it is. Um, and so I, I do my best to sort of kind of move the community in that. But at the end of the day, the community still has to like decide that they want to do it, right? Um, and, and I, I, I think that's, that's just part of the work that, that you have to do. You have to sort of navigate this highly complex community. Uh, you know, not everyone in the community is just like, oh, yes, we are all very critical and we can see all the problems, you know. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, what, what I do is so usually my students, it's my students who I tell them to think critically about the Polynesian Culture Center or to think critically about Kahuku mascot. Um, and so they are sort of kind of the ones that maybe the next generation will, will push to, to that. Another question um, we have from a graduate student um, is how can other cultures appropriately use Tava theory um, or is that seen as not appropriate and not appropriate? Oh yeah, good, good. Well, you know, right now we've, we, uh, the, most of the people who have used the Tava theory, mainly people from Moana Nui Akea, you know, um, but we've also had uh, uh, Asians. So we have we had students from Japan who have used it in architect. So other people can also use it. I think it's just as long as you are respectful and that you acknowledge uh, where the the particular uh, ideas came from, the, the roots of the ideas. And I I think even if you ask the sort of kind of the architect of the theory, uh, Augustino Mahina. Um, he, he is one of the people who is happy to share it with, with everyone. And, um, you know, and, and I also want us to also think that, you know, we can't just think that only Western theories are the only places where we can, we can draw from to, to think about our, our world and our realities. Yeah, because oftentimes, um, sometimes we think, oh, only Western theory is universal. And, you know, when it comes to indigenous theory, it's only local and specific and we cannot apply it to other other situation. And I, I think that that that's also problematic um, in, in that sense. Um, 
another question that was brought up, and I want to come back to that after uh, yeah. this question. Um, what is the status of the telescope in Mauna Kea? Has it been successfully stopped or is there still a threat of construction um, of the telescope? There's still a threat of construction. Um, right now, it's a, sort of a pause on both uh, sides. So there's nothing going on there and there's no uh, construction. And, um, um, and so we're sort of just kind of waiting uh, for to see what will, will happen. But there's uh, that's where there's that's where it's at uh, right now. Can you also give us an update on um, on the wind turbines in Kuhuku? Yeah. So all all the wind turbines that we were arrested for are all built, um, which is very sad. Um, uh, Kuhuku is this you know small town. Uh, we have uh, twenty uh, wind turbines. It's totally surrounded. Um, you know, many of them violated the law because they're so close to the schools of our elementary school. Um, where we're at now is that we are fighting them in courts. So we have a, a case right now in the Supreme Court about protecting the Ope'apea. So the Supreme Court of Hawaii is going to be hearing our case this year to see if, um, you know, Ope'apea is a cultural, uh, you know, mammal is this something worth that should be protected and so we'll see how that how that goes yeah one of the questions that go along with that is um will climate change and militarism force force oceania to form new political structures and our government in the future what are your thoughts on that dr Bailey? yeah thank you that's a great question definitely um you know because climate change is impacting uh you know people of uh, oceania in very profound and destructive ways. And so uh, one of the ways that we can uh, work together is that we have to you know, create allies and coalition and you know, be trans-indigenous with one another to be able to, to fight you know, a very powerful, uh, not only powerful nation state, but also powerful corporations. And I think this is where Haofa was talking about using Oceania as a regional way to think about our commonality and our way of coming together to protect our, our ocean. And um, so, you know, that is something that uh, I, I'm hoping that the, I, you know, nation states of the Pacific will come together in a very, uh, you know, in, in solidarity to be able to, to fight because uh, as we stand alone, it's much easier for other um, uh, nation states and corporation to, to sort of kind of discount us. I had, I had a follow-up question to that as well. In terms of um, those who are activists and those who are scholars who, um, especially after the, the past four years administration, may be feeling tired or um, trying their best to still navigate those spaces. Um, yeah. We had a couple of, uh, if you were able to watch our last couple of episodes and we talk about like uh, trauma and trying to navigate that space. So I was wondering how, and I've been thinking about this a lot, how do you tawhiva when there's so much trauma, even on an institutional and systemic level, as well as just on in, in intrapersonal level with our families? Yeah, good, good question. Um, you know, the, the one of the things that I've always uh, focused on, on va is balance, right? because you know, Taoiva is about creating balance and symmetry and so forth. So um, you, know, there, you could get to a point where it's just too much. There are a lot of different relationship and Va that you have to take care of. So you have to uh, find a way to um, scale down and also self care, um, you know, take the time to just sort of kind of take care of yourself and, and, and be okay with it, yeah. Um, you know, when the Black Lives Matter movement started happening, many of us also joined and, and, and were out, you know, protesting and, and holding sign. And then, um, you know, we, we decided that, you know, going out every week was not the way to do it. So we started to say, okay, maybe once a month, we go out and hold signs to show that we're in solidarity with uh, Black Lives Matter, but every week was a bit too much. So we sort of just kind of create balance and scale down so that we're still you know, taking care of our vow with our uh, black brothers and sisters, but at the same time, remembering that we also have other, uh, you know, other va and, and, and responsibility for for other, other other movements. 
along those lines, um, a lot of the things that we were kind of seeing in terms of like the trans indigenous movements were happening in reaction to something. What are some ways in which we can kind of create that, those spaces um, that's not in reaction to something that the settler government is doing? Yeah, yeah, very good. Um, you know, the education part was really helpful for me. You know, at, at Mauna Kea, the, you know, the Puhulu Hulu University, and also what we had here at sort of our Kulanui or Kahuku was a way for us to, to start to maybe just create a space for education and to talk about issues that um, were not related to what we were fighting, but also sort of kind of relate to other things. And I, I think that's, that's, that's very important. And I think this also speaks to the failure of uh, academic institutions, because if people are creating their own institution outside of academia, that means that, you know, University of Hawaii or, you know, even here at BYU Hawaii, we weren't like fulfilling those needs for education, creating a space for people to come and feel safe, be able to talk about those things. And I think so the, the role of us in education um, is critical to creating those particular space. And I would say that this, you know, Pacifica webinar series is one of those spaces that you have created. And we're, we're talking about the issue. We're just not just reacting to the things we're, we're creating. And so I, I want to you know, applaud you for, for creating this, um, you know, uh, both you, uh, Moana and, and uh, Dr. Vaughn and others who've been involved. And I think we need to do more of, of this, um, you know, University of Auckland, UH uh, Manoa, you know, here at BYU, um, you know, uh, also in California, we, we should do more of this kinds of, of, of uh, spaces. Thank you. Um, I think that's what was in mind when uh, Dr. Kehau Lanivan was trying to, to bring up, like, how are we still going to connect with each other even during a pandemic. And it's actually been one of the silver linings of it of it all is because we probably would have to have um, connected to everybody by bringing them in and flying them out. But then since everybody can't, we're like, wow, we have this um, across the ocean, we can bring people in through technology. Um, so we're really grateful that you're able to join us. One of the questions that I often have for um, for uh, senior scholars um, is what is what is the hope or what is your hope for future scholars that are coming up through the academy, but also community activists who don't necessarily find that um, higher education is a place for them, but they still read your work and um, are, are trying to create these trans indigenous connections. Very good, thank you, Moana. I try my best to make my work accessible. And even though I use words like trans-indigenous and you know, epistemology and ontology and so forth, uh, and I do it only in academic settings, but um, you know, if you follow me on Facebook, uh, I try my best to make my work accessible for community members who are not have access to the, to the, academy, to, you know, to the academy. Uh, uh, so you know, one of the, one of, uh, the things I, for, for, for people who are in, in academia, they gotta be able to, to write for all the audiences. You know, you gotta write for academia because that's just the nature of that colonizing institution. But you also have to write in ways that is accessible for the rest and, and find ways where you, uh, venue uh, where you uh, put your writing so that others can also have access to it. And you know, social media is a, is a really good place to do that, but but also just you know other community events uh, to attend. Um, you know, whenever uh, I get invited to speak to a church, you know, a Methodist church or so forth, I, I try my best to go and, and speak uh, because I, I I my 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 thing is try to be accessible, make it accessible. Yeah, I, I follow I, I follow our ancestor Maui who who always try to make the fire accessible to everyone. So fire is not only with the, with the chiefly class, you know, he, he <laughs> smuggle it out from the chiefly class and share fire with everyone. And so I, I, I take that model. That's my, that's my hero, both Maui and Hina, the, the two of them, you know, both Maui and Hina, 
it seemed like the knowledge that with them, they just, you know, wanted to share with everyone. And so um, I would say that would be the way to, to go. Dr. Kaili, your street credibility after this presentation of smuggling and getting arrested <laughs> has increased tenfold. <laughs> so um, one of the questions that our community members have, there um, a lot just sprung up here. Um, it seems like Polynesians frequently support the causes of other Polynesians. What dynamics do you think contribute to hesitation in supporting, say, Micronesians or Melanesians, um, their causes like Papua, Papuan independence or Kofa Compact impact? Yeah, very good. Yes. I know it can be very polycentric in the way that Polynesian work with each other and, and and it's probably just because you know we have uh, these sort of genealogical tie that's easy for us to see, but um, you know the work to do with other uh, you know other groups in Moana Nui Akea is, is 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 critical and important to make sure that we are uh, work together with them. And and I think one of the ways is to sort of kind of see what our commonalities are, what are the things that we uh, connect. Uh, as far as as, as culture uh, could be, you know, navigation or or so forth. You know, um, Hawaiians have done this very successfully with uh, you know with Papa Mao, um, and 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 that's been very successful. And you know, th there's still some challenges in their relationship with other Micronesians, and and that's not just Hawaiian, but also other groups. But you know, uh, oftentimes people do sort of kind of. Uh, create those narratives and bring those narratives back and say, hey, you remember, we, these are things that we've done that uh, has connected us in, in the past. And I, and I try to, to do that uh, often. Uh, so, you know, for, for Tongans, we, we have a really close connection with uh, Micronesians as far as some of our older uh, dances. Um, and so one of the ways to make those connections is to bring those sort of narratives and history and share them and say, you know, the metupaki, you know, the Tongan dance metupaki, according to Futahelu was, you know, a dance that we did on, on our voyage to um, um, uh, Kiribati. So, you know, what I do is I usually try to tell that story to show, hey, we've been interacting with each other for, for quite, quite some time. And, um, you know, myself and Kehau and Vince Diaz, you know, we've been trying to work on this trans-indigenous, you know, we're too, you know, Polynesian and he's Micronesian. And, and so we have been trying to, to do this kind of work to, 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 to show that we can work together on you know, this topic of trans-indigeneity. Another question we have from a graduate student is, how do we come to understand resistance and movement when colonial projects like the wind turbines and the telescope have achieved their political and imperial aims? Mm. Uh, well, uh, yes, sometimes it can feel you know, depressing, um, but I, I think just uh, the fact that we have become closer to each other because of the trans-indigenous movement. Um, you know, the people that we never did work together before, but you know, coming together as each other as sort of a way of countering settler colonialism. Um, I, I think the more that you do this, the just to strengthen the movement and that people feel like that they're not alone. So, you know, for me, you know, I never want Native Hawaiians to feel like, you know, we're the only one that's showing up to the Mauna Kea stuff and we're the only one that's showing, you know, where are my Tongans and, you know, Micronesian brothers and sisters. And I think when you see other groups come together, it really inspires them and it strengthens them and empowers them and, and so forth. Um, but you have to, to, to keep, keep at, at it. Um, um, it. It may feel like you're losing, but I think it, it, uh, that's not the case because I know that many of the corporations, I don't think there's going to ever be another wind turbine imperial project here in, in, in Hawaii because, you know, we stood up strong and we, we wanted to make sure that they would not. So they, they had one plan, plan for Waianae. So they decided they didn't want to do it in Waianae because they knew that if they would do one in Waianae, uh, the Kahuku will come and join the white people in white eyes. So it really sort of scared the, the you know, the corporate people uh, on those issues. I 
I think I'll do, I'll take the Tongan one. <laughs> yeah. As a Tongan who does this work on the ground and in the community, how do you reconcile with deep faith community among the Tongans that may not see the value of trans indigeneity and may even distance themselves from seeing this as work as being against the blessings of Fonua or um, um, Fonua Mahu? I love trans indigeneity, but deep faith communities can be difficult and draining. It's a very yeah. good question. Yeah, very good. And uh, let me just say, first of all, that I've, I, I, people have criticized me for trying to resurrect Tangaloa and Maui and Hina because these are people of the old religion. And, you know, we are Christian now. And so we don't really want to talk about all of those people and so forth. But the way I, I, I frame it to them, say, you know, these are our ancestors. Um, and so if, if you don't believe that they are a deity or if you don't believe that, but they're still our ancestors. So they are still important to us to, to talk about them and, and, and so forth. And, and that seems to be very helpful as far as uh, with, with deep faith communities to come around and see that this is, that this is like an important aspect of culture to, to participate in. And um, depending on the theology of the religion, so some sect of Christianity may be more open to trans indigeneity and others may not, uh, just depending on their own theology. But uh, from what I've seen so far, it's been mainly positive and people do see this as an important um, aspect of uh, working together with, with other, other groups. Tabita, um, what I love also about your work is, you know, you speaking to this genealogical connection between, you know, Hawaiians, Tatongans, you know, and um, Oceania in, um, by and large. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if you've read Lisa Hall's work, but she's basically critiquing Hawaiians and saying, you know, Hawaiians, you need to create more space for the other groups um, within Oceania in academic spaces or community organizing spaces in the continent in particular. And so my question to you is, how do we create more awareness along the lines that we also have, for example, a responsibility to the First Nations people of Turtle Island as um, Oceania people living on Turtle Island now, now being on the um, hosted by the First Nations people on, and their lands. How do we create more awareness around those lines? Um, and kind of use it, utilizing your model of this genealogical connections that we have amongst each other. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, Lisa Hall. In fact, I was just pres presenting with uh, Lisa last year at the you know, American Anthropological Association. And we were talking about Mauna Kea and um, it, wasn't, it wasn't just us uh, from the Pacific there, Native Americans were there. So, um, you know, indigenous people of Canada was also in our panel. Um, and so what we were, our panel was, um, we, we were actually modeling what we need to do. That if we are going to be talking about Mauna Kea in Canada, Vancouver, Canada, then the people of that place need to be in our uh, on our panel, and and I think that's the the way to, to do it. Oftentimes we sort of forget and say, oh yeah, we're, we're going to do this panel and we're just going to do it here in Utah in Salt Lake City, but not invite the um, indigenous people of that of that place to, to to participate and be part of it. And that's a you know relationship that you have to take care and you have to. Um, nurture, you know, you can't just bring them in as tokens or just say, you know, we want you to be in our paddle because we need somebody that is native so that we can, you know, fulfill our need to have to, somebody. Yes. To do a land acknowledgement. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and even, you know, I, I know that, that that's something that you, Cal, uh, has been critical about land acknowledgement. You know, that's also something that we often do, you know, just do the land acknowledgement, but no action right no action to follow the land acknowledgement you know the land acknowledgement is one but you you know you also have to do something in in return and make sure that they're not just there as tokens so just to give you the 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 example so in vancouver the na native uh, uh, canadians who were in our they they were you know fully part of it and talking about mauna kea from what they were doing in their university 
to divest their university from the telescope. So, and that was a way of sort of kind of connecting uh, our work, the natives who were doing outside of Hawaii and the ones who in Hawaii. And, and you know, I gotta give credit also to Tai Kavika Tenkan because he's the one who was like put, put this paddle together. To follow up to that, um, another graduate student has a question um, to connect to Moana's earlier question. Oh, okay, never mind. Let me move to the next question by this person. How can the academy adopt practices of Tala Ifanua and Tauhi Ifanua to go beyond land acknowledgements? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, this is the part where you actually. Uh, um, rooted on the genealogy of the concept, because the concept basically says that, you know, this, this is about the Fonua, the land, the Honua, and that it's not just acknowledging or using it in your acknowledgement, but you also have to um, do something about it. And many university have started to sort of kind of figure out, you know, so what do, what, what's our, our university responsibility to the people? Whose land our university occupied, right? And, um, and, and I think that's the first thing for university to do is to have that conversation and to think about, you know, what is our responsibility as far as like, do we need to create a, uh, you know, a, a study, you know, a, a, you know, a major in that particular area? Do, do we need to offer scholarship to them? You know, these are all the, the different ways that you could actually move beyond just the land acknowledgement, but also to in, involve thinking about of the places for Nua. And then just add to that, the university also have to do practices that are environmentally friendly and sustainable because Fonua is all about that. And if you're, you know, continue to practice things that destroys the land of Fonua, then that's also problematic. I think there was a question in the chat. Um, what hopes do you have um, for your or for the children and all the Pacifica generations of the future? Um, well, I have high hopes for them because I know that they are coming up and they are, you know, many of them are learning uh, a lot of this knowledge that, uh, you know, it took us until graduate school to learn. Yeah, for, for me and, and you, Cal, you know, we didn't get to grad school to, to learn about this stuff. But many of you are you know, learning this in high school and you're learning it in your undergraduate, which I, I think this is, uh, gives you a lot of power and empowers you to take you know, um, Oceania, Moana Nui Pacific studies to, 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 another, to another level. Yeah, and, and you know, continue the, the work of decolonizing the university. And just to think about you know, the earlier scholars such as you know, Hawofa and, and others, sort of kind of the first wave of scholars, you know, they did work, opened the door, then the next one came, you know, where you know, uh, Manulani Myers and others, you know, they also did work. And you know, hopefully our, we're doing the same and then the next generation will just continue to do that for, for on and on. We should uh, give a pause and a shout out to um, what is going on currently in Utah with Mana Academy and um, PHA and the movement to create this type of education before people get to higher education. Yeah. Um, and then one of the things that you shared in your presentation um, with uh, the song, I, I know that you and I were both there that day. Yeah. And the interesting thing was I had um, shared it on social media and there were Kanaka Maoli from back at home who were just, they just couldn't believe that there were, you know, all these kids in Utah, not only Hawaiians, not only Kanaka Maoli, but Tongan, Samoans, you know, Latinx, um, that were singing the song. Mm. And um, the message that was going back home you know, in support of Mauna Kea. Um, so I just, I kind of want to acknowledge that that work is also being done on the ground out here. And yeah. thank you all to, you know, the educators and of course, uh, Anapesi Kaili and, you know, all the Kaili Ohana <laughs> for the love and to create Mauna Academy and all the uh, school administrators and staff and PHA 
also is another school out here trying to yeah. accomplish those same things. So I want to save some space for that as well. Yeah, important. I have a final question and um, um, that I was wondering for both of you with the two things that you just um, mentioned, how with the resurgence here with the schools and then the knowledge that and the hope that you all have for the next generation. Um, also, what do you as scholars, um, I don't want to say that you're an elder indigenous, <laughs> but y'all are getting up there in the scholar, scholarly, um, like if once you're starting to be referenced and people are using your book as uh, <laughs> a book that is used to two books away from what people are publishing. Um, I think uh, Dr. Kaili just has to um, embrace that, that he's now part of that foundation and genealogy. But um, what do you see for us scholars in the future, pointing into the future? Since is this resurgence or this um, remembering, as I like to call it a lot, um, is happening, what do you see for the future of Pacific studies, uh, Moana studies? I know you all were pushing for, for the renaming, but what does the future look like? Well, I think that the future is bright for for all of you um you know i took one pacific study class at university of utah and i was on i you know i was wor working on my master's pro uh you know i was graduate school at that time and you know out of that one class you know i've been able to to do a little bit more about pacific studies and, and sort of kind of advance it so i i see that the grounding that you moana and you know uh, kale and mana and others you know, you have uh, you know you have a better foundation to to take it to to the to the next level. But you know what I you know what I envision is that in the future there will be you know not only more of you, but you will be part of the institution, and that you know um, you'll have your own Pacific Studies um, you know department or program that will go from bachelor's to master's to PhDs, right? And that, uh, and that would be something that, you know, we've, we started with one class to hopefully do be a, you know, a department and, and so forth. And, um, you know, that's, that's my, my, my vision of what will happen in the future. Cal, you have any, Dr. Ravon? Um, I just think, you know, being able to um, like, Dr. Ka'ili had said, um, building off the work of the people that came before us makes it a lot easier in terms of, you know, what we have to um, work with. Um, but my hope is that we begin to start seeing the potential in terms of us being in the diaspora um, and like what possibilities could exist in terms of creating collaborations that are not so likely. Um, and start existing in the spaces um, and owning it, right? And, and just saying, we value Aina, we value land. And um, what is our protocol? What are the intentions behind protocol? And how do we kind of resituate those values in a different place? Um, and those are all things that our ancestors, our kupuna leave for us. They're the roadmaps of how we should be living in the world. And I think, you know, a place like education can create those spaces um, to talk about these things more at length and hopefully provide some useful research. Um, and Dr. Ka'ili, you know, his community engaged work is an example of how we should, you know, be in spaces like the academy. So I've learned a lot from him. So thank you. Thank you. So one of the questions um, for connecting, we wanna make sure that after this, just like with our trans indigenous in, uh, research that you all are um, pioneering, um, what, how can students get a hold of you, Dr. Kaili? And if you have a social media handle, we can drop it in the chat box so that they can continue following you. Because I know uh, as a, someone who follows you on social media that you drop a lot of these gems um, on a daily basis. So. If you could yes. share 
Yeah, so I'm on Facebook. You can, you can find me on Facebook, and I use main. You know, I'm I'm on the old people's social media, which is Facebook. I do have a TikTok account, but I only have one video on TikTok because I don't really know how to use TikTok. Um, but I, I, you know, I, 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 you know, I have an Instagram, I have a, a Twitter, but mo but I'm mainly just Facebook because you know, uh, that's the that's the only social media that I can handle. Um, and it's really easy to, you know, if you just search for David Nakaili, you can find me on on um, on Facebook, and I, you know, try to to use it to share the work that I'm doing and and, and also share what other people are doing. Yeah. So. Hey, thank you so much. Um, so even for us, we'll share that on our social media accounts if you follow us, and we'll be also um, providing this resource, um, the recording for this on our. YouTube channel. I just want to take some time to thank Dr. Kaili so much for joining us this evening. We um, always learn something new, whether you're here or just through your writings. Um, and on behalf of the, the younger scholars or the scholars that are striving to, um, that are emerging, we are so grateful for your presence and for um, what Dr. Vaughn alluded to with um, your ability to just be super gracious to the up and coming scholars and to embody the work that you you theorize about, especially with Tawiva and Tawifonua. Um, and for me personally, um, I'm really grateful that even though you had critics and, and things talking about how you were trying to resurrect the old, the old ways and the old gods, um, your readings have impacted me since I was an undergraduate at Brigham Young University, and I've never gotten the chance to just thank you for um, opening those those spaces and places for me to dream and to understand that um, my ancestry were powerful, powerful beings and that um, whatever we build here, we can still overcome systemic racism and oppression. And I, I am so grateful that younger generations are learning that at MANA and at PHA from a younger age and don't have to wait till they're an undergraduate or a grad student. So we are so grateful and want to just convey that, that thank you for, for coming in and sharing space with us tonight. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Moana. And I want to thank the you know University of Utah Pacific uh, Island Studies Initiative, your Pacifica Web Webinar Series. Um, you know, grateful for, for all the work. You know, even your you know your Bridge Program. I, I follow. I follow all the things that you you do there. Uh, so thank you, Moana, Kale, um, you know, Mana, uh, Professor Kalani. Uh, Vaughn and also uh, Professor Hokulani Aikau and uh, you know all, all the great people who are who are behind the University of Utah Pacific uh, Islands uh, Studies Initiative. So uh, as you know, I trace my intellectual roots back to it, and uh, I'm I'm deeply honored because uh, you know since. Uh, I took the course there 23 years ago. This is the first time for me to be invited to come back. So I was really happy that you reach out to me to come back and, and to speak uh, at, at your university. I have fond memories of University of Utah, of my time there. So I hope we'll reconnect and continue to, to do other things in, in the future. And uh, happy to uh, for students to email me or uh, hit me up on, on Facebook to continue conversation about any other topics today. So. Hello. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us this evening. And um, we'll close out. Malau apito to all our contributors, specifically our bridge team, School of Transform, Education, Culture, and Society, and again, Dr. Kehaulani Vaughn. Remember to join us every other Friday evening as we tawa noa with Pacifica scholars, staff, and community leaders. Make sure to like, subscribe, 
and follow us at U of U Pacifica Scholars and the Pacifica Archive. Till next time, Tu'a Fatu.